Welcome to 2,730 Years and Counting, a podcast that is chronicling the re-emergence of the Lost House of Israel and its reconciliation with the House of Judah. Opinions of the interviewer and guests may not be the same, but we are all walking in discovery together. Come listen. Welcome to 2,730 Years and Counting. Uh, this is my podcast. I'm Gene Porter, and the reason why I have this podcast is because one of the most important things that you need to know is something that very few people know, and it's hidden in plain sight in Scripture. It's about the two houses of Israel and the fact that they've been apart since 721 B.C., in fact, even a little bit earlier than that, and they have been apart ever since, and here in the near future, they'll be coming back together again. And it's not by accident, because Yehovah is going to do what he told us he would do. And uh, there's much for us to understand about this, because all the, the, the stuff that you see happening in the world right now, all the craziness, all of the, the absurdity, all of the things that are happening, all affect this, and they all affect us. As Israelites, by the by the way, way more of you th- are Israelites than think so. So you ought to give some thought to that. Anyway, today I've got Alexander Bayich on. I haven't had him on for a while, and it just hit me the other day that with somebody like Alexander, who's staying on on, on top of things so well and so thoroughly, uh, I would be doing you a disfavor by not letting you hear what he is, has encountered in the last few years because it's very definitely important stuff and it's very, very applicable to your lives and to what you need to understand. So with that being said, I'm now going to shut up and let, let Alexander talk because he's the guy that really has the, the news and the information. So here he is. Take it away, Alexander. Well, greetings, dear friends around the world. Greetings after a long time, but uh, I'm still up to date and I'm still somewhere around. Uh, even though uh, we haven't had interviews for quite some time. Nevertheless, over these last, how many, two, three years, we've been right. seeing various developments around the world, and we've been seeing some things that we never thought we would be seeing, like, you know, uh, Nazi attitude against the Russians, uh, various sanctions against the Russians, sanctions against this, that, and the other. But, you know, dear friends, what? This is all falling into the place according to what the Bible has taught us for these years, we have known, at least those of us who follow the uh, the Bible teachings, we have known for quite some time that we will have about three three or four blocks, you know, at the end times. One block will be the Northern Kingdom, or with the North King, it will be the European Union or United States of Europe. The second block would be what people many times call the Euro Asian Euro Asian Union. Uh, basically, right. Asian countries being uh, being aligned and in alliance with one another headed by Russia, and the third block would be the Arab world, obvious with their Arab confederation. Well, according to the book of Daniel, I would presume that Egypt would be most likely the leader of that confederation, and the fourth block will be now the still Anglo-Saxon people, Anglo-Saxon block, which is, as you can see, ever weakening and declining on all fronts. Sadly, that's the case. Uh, many of you in America have already felt the inflation due to this uh, regional conflict in between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, here, here in Europe, we are feeling already shortages and all the fears of how the winter will be. They, some people say it will be the worst or the hardest winter since the Second World War, since the end of the Second World War, because the fuel shortages and uh, gas shortages may cause all kinds of economic problems. 
Nevertheless, uh, as we are now enduring that, uh, something else is happening perhaps behind our backs, but uh, something that should draw our attention very much to. Now, uh, very often I've mentioned to you that various conflicts are around the world are not really the trigger of the end of the world, because as many false prophets have been telling you, you know, since the Mayan calendar, end of the world back in 2012, and all the way up to now, and then, then we had false prophets telling us that North Korea was going to attack America, and then now we have the false prophets saying all the time, Russia is going to, you know, Russia is not really enemy, uh, uh, and but all the time, all this time, all the way up to now, Something is happening, and something is happening in the area where God's eyes are set upon. God's eyes are set upon the Middle East, because the promised land, the holy land, if you wish, the promised land, the land of Israel, is not situated in Russia or Ukraine. It's not situated in Kosovo or Serbia. It's not situated in North America, North America or North Korea or South Korea. It is right there, always right. in the Middle East. And God's mm-hmm. eyes are set upon the Middle East. Something is happening in the Middle East. Something has been happening in the Middle East that many of us perhaps have missed, or perhaps we are not really uh, we are not really sure how to interpret that that is happening. What struck me was a couple of months ago. It was uh, news from um, Jerusalem Post how the uh, Israeli Air Force upgraded its, uh, its, its military ability. So now they were able to reach the potential nuclear targets in Iran uh, much quicker without having to refuel on the way to, uh, to, to those facilities. Now that, was, that came as a news, that I, think, I remember it was, it was about June, and it was Wednesday afternoon. I was, I was working on my library, The Hope of Israel. By the way, our library, The Hope of Israel, has got about 1,000 books. That wow! Us, right. Yes, so far <laughs> over these few years, and special thanks to Christy Gorman, one of our one of my friends now, a, a wonderful lady. She asked me once, "What do you need for the library?" And she has in the well this year she has provided about three packages of the most valuable books that we could not get in Serbia. So now, uh, well, to all of our friends who know who is Stephen Collins, I've got now all of the books of Stephen Collins <laughs> on the, oh, on the house of Israel. Yes, and yes. I've got all the others, various precious books. I've got the precious book about the uh, Ralph Ralph Woodrow, you might remember, Babylonian Mystery Religion, the one that he yes. disowned later, but nevertheless, we have it now here in in English. So uh, we've got now these, these collection of books, and I've been cataloging them and sorting them out so that we can make a better use of them. We've got some books also on natural healing and medicinal herbs, you know that those are the topics that our satanic world hates and doesn't want people to know how much God has provided us in nature. And I say satanic world for those of you who are not really acquainted. This is not God's world. You know, if this was God's world, things would be like in Isaiah chapter 11. You know, uh, this is not God's world. This is satanic world. Satan is the ruler of this world. And I'm sad that many people don't get it, including many messianics, you know, and people who even claim to be, uh, you know, followers of Jesus Christ or Yeshua. This is not God's world. You know, Satan, you know, born in the Garden of Eden, and ever since then, the, the humanity has been going this wrong way anyway, all the way this. You know, God said, in a sense, I'm having hands off. Have your own civilization. Make your own choice what is right and what is wrong, and see where you will end up. Well, here is where we are ending up. You know, we're ending up in total chaos, dismay, hunger, famine. We have the four horsemen of apocalypse now running, you know, left and right, and and and, mm-hmm. and, and, and fiercely running through our nations. And thankfully, we are coming to the to the end. But Satan is the author of all of this, and it's not God. God is not the author of confusion. God certainly doesn't enjoy people, you know, being hungry. God certainly doesn't enjoy the planet being destroyed and so on. So Satan is, in a sense, as we know from the book of Job, you know, Satan is is still the instrument of God in deceiving these people and leading them astray before. God finally decides to intervene and send us the Messiah, Messiah, the Messiah, that is going to sort this all out. And only when Messiah comes, we're approaching another day of atonement. I want to draw attention, if I may, Jane, to, to our audience, uh, about something that I see missing in, uh, in the Christian world, in Messianic world, in Jewish world, about the, the uh, uh, essential meaning of the day of atonement. 
Many of you, friends, I'm afraid, have missed the the important thing about the Day of Atonement. Yes, it is the day when we are fasting and uh, humbling ourselves before the Eternal so that we can become at one. That's why it is called in English atonement, at one man, right. you know. Mm-hmm. We can become right. one with God only when we are not, when we are sinless. Now it's a perfect, wonderful occasion that God has given to all, all of us who really are followers of Jesus Christ, followers of Yeshua, that we can become at one with God because on that day we're completely cleansed from all of our sins, you know. Interestingly enough, that day in Serbian rendering is called the day of cleansing. Uh, we're cleansed. Wow. You see, yeah, and then I have to tell people why we're being cleansed. We're being cleansed so that we become at one with God, at one meant we have. But however, there is something else in this very important holiday, in this crucial holiday. Friends, um, this crucial holiday also is the um, symbolism, the meaning of Satan being deposed from his worldly throne. You see, Yeshua, you see the Messiah, he's coming to depose him. He came, you see, the, many Jews never believed in the Messiah because they say it was never prophesied that he would come for the first time, or for two times. Well, he did come the first time as, as a baby. He was a human being. The second time, as it's written, he's coming in full power and glory. He's coming to destroy this system, this terrible satanic system that changed the whole world. And we know that the trumpets are going to announce his coming, the trumpets in the book of Revelation. And right after the trumpets, what we have, we have a, uh, an angel coming down with huge chains to chain or to depose, to depose Satan from his worldly throne. You know, we are being cleansed from all the sins whose author is Satan, the devil, on the Day of Atonement. But at the same time, this wonderful holiday that we are going to keep, we are going to keep in about how many? One month? In about one month and a few days. Yeah. That mm-hmm. wonderful holiday is actually also a picture of Satan being deposed from the throne. And then Mashiach is going to sit, of course, on the throne over the earth. He'll be sitting on the throne of David, and he'll be ruling throughout the whole world, and he's going to restore this wonderful planet, you know, and, and, and make it like the Garden of Eden. And then we'll have Isaiah 11 that is going to be fulfilled when, you know, lamb and wolves and humans will be playing with, 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 with serpents and lambs and wolves will sleep together and cats and dogs and all of the, all of the nature will be in perfect peace. Nothing yes. will you know, harm. I, uh-huh. Yeah, I, I agree with you, brother. I think that uh, a lot of people need to realize that, you know, they, when, I, I, whenever I go to a funeral, I hear people saying, place, but th- that better place is right here. Yes. And yes. at the proper time, he or she will be brought back that, to, to, yes. to live in this better place. And well, that's what I, we need to understand. Why would Yehovah make this perfect planet for us, for us to mess it up and then decide to take us out of it and put us somewhere else? Right. And his, the way he works, he's a God of restoration. And yes. he's going to restore this planet and we're going to have a place to live. And it will be right. wonderful. And like you say, We'll get to walk with Yehovah in the cool of the evening again. Yes. I can't wait. I can't wait. Brother. I mean, I hear also people saying, oh, they want to go to heaven so that they could praise the Lord all the time. Well, how, how, how dumb that, yeah. well, how, yeah. how boring that is. I mean, what would you be That's doing? Right. You know, waving your hands in heaven. There's nothing in, in, in the sky. You know, it's just a few clouds. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't, wave your hands and praise be the Lord all the time. It's so boring, yeah. you know. We've got so Wouldn't much it be work better to, do. to be in his presence. Yeah. Right. I agree. I agree, right. Because buddy. the revelation says that he's going to punish and destroy those who destroyed the earth. Exactly. We have That's plenty right. of destroyers exactly. of the earth. So we'll have plenty of work to do, friends, here, down here, under the direction of the Mashiach. And, and we'll have plenty of things that we have to clean up. There'll be, there'll be nuclear wars. In, in the world, there'll be all kinds of destruction before he comes. So we need to, right. we need to release the, 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 the captive Israelites from the concentration camps. We need to clean up all, all kind of pollution. And we need to then deal with stubborn, you know, nations who don't want to really, you know, submit. Right. We have to deal with that and teach them the other way. So there's plenty of work, like you said, Gene, here down on this earth. This is the better place. This is the place he created for us. And yeah. you know what? As far as I know in the Bible, there is no life anywhere else in the cosmos. And, right. you know, in vain, all of these NASA's efforts to find life in cosmos, they will not find anything. There is no life there, you see. Why? Right. Well, because the, 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 the eventually we are to become family of God, that we are to just then spread all over the universe and breathe in life into the universe, yeah. you know? That's right. Why? And... Yeah. 
And yeah. And we, this earth, and I know there are going to be people that are going to say he's an idiot when they hear this. But when I say it, I mean it. And that is that the earth is at the center of the universe. Yes. Mankind is at the center of the universe. Because yes. it was created for us. Right. And, and, why and they can go out there and they can beat themselves bloody trying to find right. life somewhere else. And, and they'll find happen. nothing. Exactly. That's right. And why does it say in the Bible, in the last, very last chapter of the Bible, in the Revelation, that God is going to, you know, come down from the third heaven? Where? Is he going to yes. Mars? To, to uh, you know, Venus? To no, he's coming down to the earth. To be right. in the That's midst right. of all, you know, all of right. his family, all of the... In the midst, yes, exactly right, in the center of the universe, you're right. So they can, you know, they can beat themselves to blood like those Baal's prophets did when, 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 yes. uh, when Elijah <laughs> was, was, was mocking them. But they will not find any life friends there. Just deal with That's that. Right. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Does it mean that, uh, that Michelle would have to die for every single, I don't know how many civilizations out there? Please, <laughs> friends. Yeah. That doesn't make exactly. any single sense. Yes, you're right. Earth is here, the center. We have plenty of destroyers of the earth. So Mashiach That's is right. going to deal with all those destroyers and we'll have plenty of, plenty of things to do here on the holy mountain of the Lord. As it says in Isaiah 11, there'll be no harm. Where is the holy mountain of the Lord? Well, it's not in Venus or in Neptune. It's here on the earth. So, uh, uh, messianics and other dear friends you need some common sense that you need to use because I'm afraid in this religious world of all kinds of all flavors, this ecumenical age there is one, there is something that lacks in all of these religions and that what lacks and it's a common factor that lacks is common sense you know, I'm, right. I'm, I'm so sad to say that but that's the truth and this is not, I mean messianics are not an exemption exception Christianity is not exemption at all. No religion. There, there are things. There's one thing that misses there is common sense. All right. So now let's get back to the common sense. <laughs> now that we <laughs> mentioned right. this, I wanted to refer to this day of atonement because, friends, you need to understand the day of atonement has much deeper meaning. It has a terribly deeper meaning, terribly deep importance for us because in that day we're being cleansed from all of our sins. We're completely sinless at the end of the day because we become at one with God. We cannot become at one with Him if we are sin because God has no dealing with sin. Remember, He even turned away His, His, His face from His, His Son when His Son took the sin of the world upon Himself. And then His Son cried, why have you, why have you forsaken me? You see? Because God hates sin. He doesn't deal with sin. We become at one. It's day of atonement. We become at one with, with God because we are cleansed on that day from all of our sins. How amazing that is. But the other thing is, the Day of Atonement pictures the de deposition uh, of Satan the devil by the Messiah. You need to understand right. that. The Day of Atonement has connection with Revelation 20, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 1, 2, and 3, I think, when, the, when Satan will be chained and thrown into the bottomless pit so that he could not deceive nations anymore. Uh, that's why we have all of this mess, because God is not the ruler of this world. Satan is still. But when Messiah comes... He's going to depose him, and that's the meaning of the Day of Atonement. Sadly, the Jewish world does not understand it because they don't, they have different idea about Mashiach. The Christian world has no clue, even though, you know, they're, they're full of, they're, they're, they're mouthful of Jesus and Jesus and Jesus. They've forgotten that Jesus is coming back. You know, to them, Jesus is somewhere up there in the skies, somewhere up in the heaven doing his own business. While meanwhile, down here, they can just, you know, do whatever they wish to do and keep all the paganism, you know, that's for Christianity, so-called Christianity. Yeah. Messianists have got this messed up ideas about, you know, they want to, they want to reach the, the, the land, the land, the land. They're so much obsessed with the land. Well, before the land, the Messiah has to come and clean up the land and prepare the land for, for, for the tribes of Israel. So, uh, so much common sense is lacking. Let's back, let's go back to the common sense. So I said to you a minute ago that about a couple of months I was alarmed by the, uh, uh, by the writing in the New Jerusalem Post. Because within their information of how the uh, Air Force, Israeli Air Force, is upgrading its capabilities, there was one sentence that alarmed me. A sentence said, this is all in the preparations for a possible war with Iran. Yeah. I was like, w what? Possible war with Iran? Iran? Why? Well, yes, we know that Iran is has threatened on various occasions that they would... That they would, you know, wipe Israel off the map, uh, and 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 I, we understand that the Israel, that Iranian regime is terribly anti-Semitic. Yes, 
But here was the Jerusalem Post mentioning a possible war with Iran. I was like, wait a second. So I just went, you know, searching left and mm-hmm. right and, you know, asking these deaths. And then you wonder, then something comes to my, then something comes to my attention that was not there before, you know, because, you know, that's what means gre- growing in grace and knowledge. You know, as things develop in our world, we just keep growing in grace and knowledge. And unlike our ancestors, unlike others who were before us, we do have now better understanding of the of the of the prophecies in the Bible and possible personalities that might be fulfilling those prophecies. We have it better because, brethren, we have been growing in grace and knowledge. Uh, so you know our right. wonderful servants of God before us, they have had certain understanding. They've passed it on to us, and we we have been growing in that. And then as I, as I researched this, this topic, I realized, you see, Iran and Israel, the state of Israel, have been involved in essentially a cyber war with occasional sabotage and death for the past several years. And yeah. Israel has already done several preemptive strikes against, these, against Iran, and both have threatened destruction of the other. Both can cause the other serious damage, you see. And if you yes. continue then to follow the, the Jewish press, you can see all the time this topic coming up all the time. Iran, you know, what was the latest drill that they had? The latest drill uh, we learned on Friday afternoon, this past Friday afternoon, it was uh, it was the Serbian national television site, which brought to us the news that uh, that Israeli jet fi- jet fi- fi- jet fighters were able to sneak into the Iranian airspace. Uh, and they were not even detected. They exactly. were they were there for 60 seconds, I think, at least, and they were undetected. So on several occasions, it says, in the, in the past two months, the Israeli jet fighters sn- you know, uh, sneaked into the Israeli air, air, uh, air, airspace, into the Iranian airspace, that is, and they, you know, they were there and they were undetected. That was right. what is Friday, 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 Friday uh, afternoon. This this past Friday afternoon. Today is Monday night, at least here in Serbia, or Monday and, Monday afternoon in in uh, in America. So yes, you know, you know, one thing that I, I want to point out that that some people who haven't listened to this program very much probably won't understand exactly, but it's so true that isn't it interesting that that Israel, the home of Judah, and the United States, the home of Ephraim. Work together to do this. Yes. And that, and that, uh, the United States gives the F-35s to Israel. And then yes. Israel replaces their, all their innards with their own innards. Right. So, so the point is, the point is the two are working together. And I, I think this is, this is emblematic of what is coming. That this yes, will happen indeed. more and more. more and and more. that we will actually, we'll have to, we'll have to help take care of each other because either one alone is in trouble. Yes. Oh, absolutely but to, true. But together, together, we have a shot. Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, however, that's uh, a secret plan by the European Union is to basically push United States of America out of the Middle East. You know, yes. America yeah. is always a, a threat to United Europe, of course, led by Germany. Who else? So uh, we will we will see that obviously coming in the next few years. Now, you realize when Donald Trump was president, there was much greater support for Israel. Here now with Biden, Biden seems to be kind of looking the other way. Meanwhile, Iran is developing its nuclear weapons. Uh, European Union is looking the other way as well. You know, well, what else can you expect yeah. from the European Union, which is anti-Semitic to the core, actually? They don't yeah. show it, really, but it, they are. I live in That's Europe, right. so I can tell you that. And um, anyway, yes, uh, but something else that here is what prophet, uh, prophet Isaiah was inspired to write, you know, millennia ago. It's in Isaiah chapter 22. We have one passage, we have uh, verse 6, which speaks about Elam. Elam, it says, bore the quiver with chariots of men and horsemen, and Kir uncovered the shield. It shall come to pass that your choicest valleys shall be full of chariots, And the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. Verse 8, he removed the protection of Judah. Now, this is now, you know, very, this is now very striking. So, yes, you're right. The state of Israel is supernaturally protected. I'm I'm, I'm aware of that, and I'm sure that you would agree with me. Because such a small state, you know, being surrendered by, uh, surrounded by so many enemies, could certainly not survive without Jehovah's protection. But here we have verse 8. This is a prophecy, friends. 
he removed the protection of Judah. So at one point, he's going to remove protection of Judah. And then it says, you looked in that day to be armor of the house of the forest. You also saw the damage to the city of David. Because we know the city of David is part of Jerusalem. Of course, it's a tourist uh, tourist attraction right now. And some people say that that's real, the, the real old city of Jerusalem, not really the the one quarter which they, 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 they dubbed, you know, old city. So you also right. saw the damage to the city of David that it was great. And you gathered together the waters of the lower pool. You numbered the houses to, of Jerusalem and the houses you broke down to fortify the wall. You also made a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool. But you did not, you did not look to its maker. In other words, the, the, the house of Judah was uh, relying upon itself as they do to the day. They were not looking to their maker, you see. Nor did you have respect for him who fashioned it long ago. Now this is Isaiah 22 verse 8 through 11, 6 through 11, that is, this is New King James Version. Now, uh, we have in, ver- in verse 6, Elam. Now, Elam, uh, you need to realize, friends, is a reference to at least some in Iran. Uh, to some in Iran, because um, uh, uh, the Elamites, as far as we understood the genealogy and the origin of nations, Elamites today are various Slavic people, Western Slavic people, meaning Serbs, Croats, uh, people of former Yugoslavia, Poles, Czechs, and Slovaks, uh, they're descendants of Elam. But Elam is originally from Iran, and uh, various Croatian, for example, historians always say that the origin of the Croatian nation is from Persia, which is the real name of Iran. Uh, uh, Iran was called Persia for, well, how many? For, for millennia, before yeah, I, don't know when, I don't know when they changed the name, but nevertheless it's Persia, you know. So Elam is a reference to at least some of Iran. You see, because Iranians comprise nearly 70% of the country, and though they are Islamic, they are totally distinct from the neighboring Arab people of the Middle East. Because they are a mixture of people of the remnants of media, the old uh, media, media empire, and also Elam and other ancestors of Semitic and Hamitic stock, meaning of the white and black, and, and black peoples. So, uh, this was well known in the last century. Stump Keith, one of the, uh, one of the British, uh, historians and, and, and thinkers wrote about this. And as far as this Kir that is mentioned, uh, as far as the identification of Kir goes, well, there are several possibilities. There is one possibility that the Bible tells us that after Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, took over Damascus, he moved Syrians, Syrians to Kir, K-I-R. And while this does not mean, of course, that Kir must or must only be a reference to Syria, the fact that Syria is an ally of Iran is very interesting. In fact, Syria is, uh, I would say, the most reliable ally of Iran, you see. Uh-huh. And some, some believe that Kir perhaps is an area in the south of Iran. There are others who suggest that it's an area closer to the Black Sea. But you, need, you see, what we see in the Bible, God's word has the expression, the Syrian from Kir, in the book of Amos, prophet Amos chapter 9, verse 7. So uh, this uh, Kir, uh, the noise you might hear is the crack, firecrackers, by the way. Somebody is probably celebrating something outside, so don't be concerned. It's not a war. Nobody's going to kill, nobody's coming to kill me. <laughs> One of these days when the beast, when the European dictator comes, well, they'll, they'll most likely come for me, but not yet, not yet, but we're getting too closer to that end, to that time. So anyway, the expression that God has the Syrians from Kir in Amos 9-7, uh, is basically confirmation to us that Kir of Isaiah 22 would include Syrians, you know. In other words, so this prophecy in Isaiah 22 does include, so includes Elam, meaning Iran, includes obviously Judah, you see we mentioned the city of, old city of David, there is mention of Jerusalem, and obviously Syria, some Syrians. So the Bible also tells of a time there was a Kir, that the Kir will be destroyed, that's in Isaiah chapter 15 and verse, verse 1. Let's go to Isaiah 51. So Kir will be destroyed, which is interesting. So that is another, that is actually another prophecy. And it says, the burden of Moab, uh, because in the night, uh, because in the night, let me see the, uh, the better translation here. The Moab, uh, because in the night are of Moab is laid waste, 
and brought to silence because in the night Kir of Moab is laid waste and brought to silence. So we have this prophecy about the total destruction of this K-A-R. But we also have the, another prophecy in Isaiah, chapter 17, which I'm sure you, you know very well, Gene, and everybody else who reads the Bible knows. It says, Isaiah 17, 1, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city and it shall be a ruinous heap. Right. In this verse it says, ruined. So it will be ruined. Now, various people and various individuals uh, thought that the uh, conflict between Syria and Islamic State, that some damage that was brought to Damascus was the fulfillment of this prophecy, but no, that's not the case. Friends, Damascus was, was still operating as the capital of Syria, even during that conflict with the, with the Islamic State. And Damascus is still well and alive, you know. And it's not a heap of a ruinous heap. It's not a heap of rubble, you see. So that prophecy hasn't been fulfilled yet, you see. Which means that prophecy is to be fulfilled in our time. Isn't that interesting? Yes. You see? Immensely we, interesting. You see how we, re- great, we grow in grace and knowledge as time goes on. Now, right. since, since Syria is Iran's closest ally, that means that military cooperation between the two countries against Israel looks very much consistent with the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 22. And then uh, we saw in verse 8, in Isaiah 22 verse 8, Judah. Now, of course, we know that it's a reference to those in the land commonly called Israel or the state of Israel. And the Bible tells us that God will allow Israel to be attacked, you see, because the protection of Judah was removed all of a sudden. That's right. And in Isaiah 22 verse 9, we considered the damage to the city of David. Now, it's obviously a reference to at least part of Jerusalem because the city of David today is part of Jerusalem, right? So, uh, as we all know, the Jewish people have declared Jerusalem that it's their eternal capital. Yes, and that position, of course, is consistent with damage to happen to Israel because we know that there are other forces that want (laughs) to take Jerusalem, right? Right, No, We have the Arab forces, who want, we have Palestinians who want to have East Jerusalem, was it East Jerusalem to be uh, their uh, their capital, right? Was it East Jerusalem or West Jerusalem? I, 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 uh, East, 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 East Jerusalem, Jerusalem, right. So they want East Jerusalem, you know, the Arabs want East Jerusalem. You also know that in the Islamic religion, uh, Jerusalem is the third sacred, uh, most sacred place after Mecca and, and Medina, I guess, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And, yes, yes, and you realize, you realize also that... Uh, even the Jews themselves, they, you know, they, they envision that as their capital. Yes. And even they don't understand. There are a few of them that do, but most of them don't understand that they have a whole lot of cousins and brothers and sisters that have yes. to come home right. before it's the capital. It's the capital of all Israel, not of just all Israel. Judah. Right. right, exactly. Exactly. Then we have the other force called so-called Christians who also have interest to take Jerusalem. Why? Well, because uh, Jerusalem is the city where their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was walking and doing miracles and stuff like that, you know. So you have the Roman Catholic Church pretty much interested in some various sites in Jerusalem. One of those sites is called the Cenacle. Uh, Cenacle is the place where obviously, according to to some uh, accounts, uh, the followers of Yeshua gathered for for the day of Pentecost, and on that day of Pentecost, they were given the Holy Spirit. Uh, yep. It's uh, it's a it's a house owned by uh, by uh, the the uh, by the mother of Mark, the Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. His mother, according to historical uh, accounts, was very wealthy, and the house was very very large. So all the all those uh, all those followers of Yeshua. Uh-huh. We'll gather there, according to his instruction. He told them, stay here until you be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So they stayed until the, until Shavuot, or until the first, the, we can call it first New Testament Shavuot, first New, the first Shavuot in the New Testament, or renewed Testament, if you wish. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the first Shavuot, and they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, that cynical is still there, and uh, the Catholic Church is very much interested in it, you know. Uh, now let me let me just throw in a little speculation. I, I know when I know that our listeners love when we speculate based on the Bible. 
Uh, we know that in the, the gospel, in the gospel of, uh, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke, there's a prophesied, as well as in the book of Daniel, we have the prophecy about the abomination of the desolation. Right. Okay, so, uh, well, of course, who could be abominable? Well, there's one abominable religion out there, Roman Catholic Catholicism and their rites and rituals. It's full of abominations anyway, just like right. in, just like in any other, in the rest of the so-called Christianity, in the rest of the normal Christianity. So we can just imagine what if, uh, say, what if, uh, what if a uh, Pope, one of these days, when Jerusalem, we know from the New Testament, Jerusalem will be taken, right? Jerusalem will be surrounded and, and, and taken by the European armies, by the way, because the Romans were the ones who in 70 AD surrounded the Jerusalem and destroyed it. Now, uh, since the Bible has the duality in prophecy, and Romans were Europeans, they were not Asians, by the way, they were Europeans, that means that Europeans, again, who are just love, you know, who are in love with their so-called religion, would occupy Jerusalem again. Now, among the Europeans, there is one nation that has always regarded itself as a master race, as uh, defenders of Christianity against the paganism and, 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 and barbarians. Which nation is that, dear friends? Only one. They're called the Germans. Anyway, so, what if... So once they surround Jerusalem, according to the prophecy, and then the Roman Catholic churches brings these statues of so-called Virgin Mary, and uh, what if they perform a mass in that semicolon, you know? Or imagine if it would be an Easter, Easter Sunday, being the most, the greatest abomination of all, according to Ezekiel chapter 8, you know? When, when God uh, led the prophet through, through all of these visions, he says, oh, you know, like, come and let me show you what your kinsmen are doing in darkness, you know? And he sees all kinds of Horrible things and, oh, come and see, then you'll see something worse. There are women weeping for Tammuz, you know, or, uh, yeah. oh, but this is not the worst. You haven't seen it yet. Come and see the worst. People turned toward the east, worshipping sun. In the Catholic countries, at least in uh, South America, it's still the custom that on Easter Sunday, people are waiting, turned toward the east and worshipping the, the rising sun. Uh, and God says that's the greatest abomination of all. Now, we also know that Easter itself is a horrible abomination that Constantine the Great, the great pagan, imposed on Christianity. Uh, he replaced the Passover, the true ordinance of God, with this horrible thing. So just imagine, Easter, Sunday, sunrise mass. Idolatrous, horrible, you know, mass. What, and it being done in a cynical, what if the, uh, the first beast, the European dictator, attends the mass and then, you know, a bunch of Catholics attend the mass and there is a mass. If that, well, because mass itself is idolatrous and it's, it's, it's cannibalism as well because the, the, the Catholics believe that they, they truly, that what they have, that by hocus pocus preparandus, you know, their priests turn the wine into true blood of Jesus Christ. And that this little, uh, waffle, hostia, that it's, uh, it becomes a real body of Jesus Christ, you know, which is totally contrary to anything in the Bible, let alone the Mass itself. So just imagine a Mass service being held in that cynical. Wouldn't you think, my friends, that could be the abomination of the desolation? Well, I think so. <laughs> because that would be right. the place where, you know, where God inspired uh, and when he filled his people with the Holy Spirit. So, uh, the third force that is interesting in Jerusalem are the Europeans and Germans and the Catholic Church. So, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, where, where, what did we mention? We mentioned, uh, we mentioned the city of David in, in, in verse 9 of yes. chapter 22, yes. So we have, you know, uh, we have, uh, we also mentioned that Jews uh, consider Jerusalem to be their eternal capital, forgetting, of course, right. that they have been they have been allowed to populate as a part of Israel the Promised Land. Why? Well, they are dear friends there now, as they are preparing the way for the rest of Israel to finally come back to come back home. And then, of course, when that happens, <coughs> then we are going to have uh, Jerusalem being the eternal city of. All Israel, and of course, all the world as well. Because in Romans chapter 11, the Apostle Paul tells us a mystery. He tells us that the mystery is that all people eventually will be grafted into Israel. All people yeah. will be grafted into Israel. The whole world will become Israel, of course, because he's God of Israel. He's revealed as God of Israel in the Bible. 
Uh, I don't care what people think, but that's what it says from the beginning to the end. You know, he's God of Israel, which doesn't mean that he is nationalistic and chauvinistic God. It just means that he chose one nation, Israel, and that nation had a certain role to fulfill, and it is going to be fulfilling after the Mashiach comes back, you know. And, I, and, and, we, and when we'll be in the process of restoring, cleaning up, restoring this earth, and making the whole earth become a paradise. Yes, the paradise is here, down here, dear friends. It is down here, it's not up there in heaven when you'll be supposedly waving your hands and praising Lord forever. How boring that is, anyway. Yes. Now, <laughs> isn't that boring? I agree. Completely. You tell yeah. me if it's not. Is that, you know, you just imagine, you know, day and night, you're standing away with your hands, and you're just praising the Lord, and that's all that you have. Well, you know, the thing is that, why would, I mean, would I rather be on a cloud up in, you know, up in the, in the, the wild blue yonder <laughs> doing that, or would I rather be doing that by his side as we walk in the cool of the evening? Right, exactly. I mean, boy, <laughs> I'm trying to imagine you sitting on a cloud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No thanks. Yeah, there's nothing up there, friends. Don't you? Why don't you get it? There's nothing in heaven. I mean, That's right. and there is a dead universe. Why does it say in Romans chapter 8? Well, well, do you read Romans 8, verse 21 and 22? In the past, I would wrongly refer to Romans 1. No, Romans 1 said that we are to worship creator rather than creation. But Romans 8, uh, the other day I just realized I was wrong. It's Romans 8, 21, 22, 23. Romans 8 say that the whole creation is eagerly waiting for the appearance of the sons of God. Why? Right. So that it would be uh, released from decay and death, because the whole universe is dead, you see. Right. And and, and you know, be, uh-huh. you you remember you remember the uh, the series of books that were very very popular, the the Left Behind books, you right. know. And uh, you know, my admonition to everybody who's listening to this is pray to be left behind. In other words, you want to stay here. You don't want to go where they want you to go. You want to stay right here with Yehovah. Yes. Because this is what he's going to revamp. He's going to change this planet. He's going to make it perfect. Yes. And he is going to, to put it back in the condition he made it in so that man could live and spend all of his life and his time and his efforts and his energy here. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And then once we do that, then we have another project called Universe. In decay and death. And then he's going to send us, you know, there will be so many members of, let's say, God family, you know, when we finally all come to what people call salvation, okay? When we become uh, transformed from our physical bodies into the uh, glorified body that, that, that Mashiach has right now, then the whole universe is waiting for us. Then that's what right. we do with the earth, we're going to do with the universe. It's actually us. That's why it says in Romans 8 that the whole creation is just eagerly waiting for that moment that the sons of God appear so that they would what? Well, breathe in life into the universe. So NASA can be, you know, searching left and right, back and forth, east and west. NASA is just wasting so much money. You exactly. Know, oh, I wish they gave me some of that money. I could, I could be a wonderful log cabin and, 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 you know, I could start some organic farming in this country, but they're wasting your money, my dear friends. They will not find right. any life at all. Oh, sometimes right. they come with this, with this sensational, uh, uh, headlines. Oh, you know, there might be, there might be some water on Mars. Oh, perhaps there were traces of life in I don't know what planet. Rubbish, red, red, and rubbish. They're just telling you trash. No, there is no life anywhere else. No, and and you know the sad part of that is I I believe that this, the the single biggest reason for them doing that is to try to disprove Yehovah. Yes. In other words, they want they they want to push him off of his throne, right. and they want to say, "Don't worry about it. Man can handle everything by himself. We don't That's need right. him." And like you said, isn't that a kind of a plot against the Messiah's return? Because when yes. Messiah comes, they'll say, "Oh, here is this." Strange life in the universe. Oh, they're attacking our system. Let's defend ourselves. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, friends, what is Armageddon all about? What is Armageddon yeah. all about? Armed Megiddo. The, the, the value of, of, of fate, as it says, well, in Serbian rendering in, in, in Joel. Well, what is Megiddo is all about? They're all getting together because there is this space force coming to take their earth. Yes, the space force will be Mashiach. And he's resurrected saints as well. They'll just come down and destroy their armies. But I mean, that's what they're doing. They're actually preparing the mindset of yours so that you'll be thinking there is an outside uh, 
enemy, that there is a space right. enemy, you know, who is okay. co- coming now to destroy our wonderful, dear, beautiful civilization. Yes. It's not beautiful at all. It's disgusting, by the way. That's I right. mean, look at our cities. Look at your cities, America. You're supposed to be a Christian nation. Look at your cities. The whole world just watches from time to time all the reports. Shooting here, shooting there, shooting at schools, shooting at trade center. What kind of Christian nation you are? You have become, you have become just a bunch of careless, careless That's pagans right. who just keep Christmas and Easter and have nothing to do with Jesus Christ at all. You know, you just have mouthful right. of Jesus, yeah, whom you will give your heart and then wave your hands when you go up to heaven to the better place and praise him all the time. Huh. Well, you see, uh, it's your knowledge, America, that is going to 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 uh, condemn you. I'm I'm coming to realize that more and more. Of all the nations on the earth, America, listen to me carefully. All the nations of the earth, you are the nation, the most educated nation when it comes to true religion from the Bible. You are the people who preserve the Bible. You are the people whose constitution was written based on the Bible. You are the people whose ancestors and founding fathers said, you know, we, you know, people of the United States, according to, you know, and they, you know, all of your laws were basically written based on the Ten Commandments. What happened to you, America? You of all the nations, America, know who you are. Because your right. heraldry tells you, your national flag tells you about that. Your heraldry you cannot really uh, deny uh, right. The way how you were founded, all of a sudden, of, of one insignificant new world, you become a world power. You, you you know, it doesn't happen without any supernatural intervention, whether you like it or not. And all of that because of the righteousness of your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's right. And you had very great intellectuals, America, like no other nation had in the world. All those intellectuals who dedicated their lives to searching the scriptures and proving to you certain things, you know. And you know that Christmas is pagan. You know that Easter is pagan. You know that disgusting Halloween cannot be of God. You know all of that. And yet you say, who cares? We don't want to be God's people. We want to be pagans. Well, fine, really. Well, because you want to be pagans, there is one scripture in Deuteronomy 28 which tells you that you'll be enslaved by the pagans. And when you're enslaved by the pagans, then you'll see what it is really to be pagan when you'll be serving stone and wood. That's what it says in the Bible, you know. How shameful, way, America. Yeah. You're, you're the most educated, the most uh, uh, emancipated nation on the earth. You have now become the the, 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 the seed of all immorality and LGBT right. uh, agenda and all of that other horrible things. That's right. Yes. That's right. And we, and once again, once, you know, we, we who have had the greatest gifts from Yehovah are denying the very Yehovah that gave us those gifts. In other words, yes. we, we're building we're building a whole fiction. We're, we're building a whole lie uh, about how we came to be what we came to be. We're, we're building yes. it on the, the wrong notion that yes. somehow or other we're righteous, or that somehow or other we are we are uh, we have the we have the right and we deserve right. all of the wonderful things we've gotten. But I'll tell you what, brothers and sisters, the what's coming. It's what we deserve, and you, 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 you will not like it. No, and only when you'll be happy. taken all of that material wealth when it's taken from you. And this, what I'm saying about America, the same applies to you, Britain, British right. Isles, and Australia, and New Zealand, and Canada. It all applies to your uh, your heraldry. Oh, Britain, your heraldry speaks so much about your identity. You cannot deny it. Mm-hmm. Your heraldry right. speaks who you are. Ephraim, you know, English Ephraim, you know, Scottish people are obviously many of them from Simeonites, Welsh people, many of Welsh people descend from Levites. Do you know your identity is Welsh and Scottish? You should. But English people, you have no excuse. Look at your unofficial anthem. Look at your unofficial anthem. Listen to England. It, 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 it screams right in your face who you are. Yes. No, you say, we don't want to be God's people. No, we want to be pagans like those enemies of ours, like those Germans, like those uh, whatever other nations you want to pick up. Shame on you. How about you Scandinavian people? How about you Scandinavians? Denmark? Denmark, where do you get your name from? The resting place of Dan. Who is Dan? One of the tribes of Israel. Norwegians. What is your national symbol? Wolf. Read in Genesis 49, what does it say about Benjamin? How about you, Dutch people? How about you, Dutch people? Do you know who you are? 
seafaring people, once upon a time the greatest seafaring nation in the world before English took over. How about you, French? Do you know who you are, Paris? Do you know who you belong to? Do you know that you're the firstborn of Jacob? That you're Reubenized? Do you know that? What's, and, but you know, of all the peoples, yes, of all the Israel, the leading nations, Britain, America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the punishment will be the greatest on you because you had the greatest blessings from God. That's right. But not only that, you had the greatest minds, you Britain as well, minds who are telling you who you are, proving to you. Do you know that in the first century British church, Celtic church, kept which day of the rest? Oh, you know that, English people, because you know the blue laws. You still have the true day of rest. It's there. It's the Sabbath. You know that. You see, other nations have no clue. They're Gentiles. They have no clue what they, you people know from, from, from Anglo-Saxon world. You know, people in, in Slovakia, people in Russia, people in Serbia, people in Albania have no clue about the true day of rest, about the true days of rest, about the God's holidays. But you people in Anglo-Saxon world, you know. But you willfully ignore it. You know? That's right. Yeah, you willfully ignore it because you, we want to be pagans. We don't want to be different. Why not? What's wrong with being God's people? What's wrong with being God's people? And then God says to Isaiah, the same Isaiah that we're analyzing, and we'll get back to it, don't worry. I know where I am, but I need to warn <laughs> you about things, yeah. you know, in, in the meantime. You know, and That's Isaiah, right. the, the beginning of Isaiah, God says, you know, ox knows his master, and the cattle knows where their home is. But look, my people have no idea who they are anymore. That's they have right. no idea because they've exchanged me for dead things, for wood and, 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 and silver and gold. In other words, for idols that speak not, cannot help, they can, they're just helpless. That's what you're doing all the time, people of Anglo-Saxon world. You don't want to be God's people. No, you want to keep your Christmas. It's because it's nice custom. Really. Do you know how many people were murdered? Do you know what is the origin of that? Oh, but it's a Christian. No, it's not Christian. It's not Christian, it's pagan, it's the, the, the birthday of Baal. So it has nothing to do with Christianity. Oh, but we make it, oh, you make it Christian. Really? How, when in the world, oh, my Israel, have you got authority to change God's word? Where, well, who gave you that wonderful hocus pocus preparandus, you know, wizard, wizard power that you can change a pagan holiday and make it Christian? There is no, there is no way. And you Americans know that very well. You know it's a pagan custom, but you always tell me, but you know, we, we don't celebrate paganism. Yes, you do. Yes, you do, because right. you're going to take a pagan custom and say, oh, it's a Christian now, so we're Christians now. No, it's still the birth of the Invictus soul, the invincible son of the Romans, you know. Right. And, you know, and, and your father in your faith really is the Constantine the Great, who was born in Serbia, by the way, you know, the largest Serbian cities, Constantine the Great, who was the one who was pushing all of that, amalgamating in the 4th century syncretism, mixing of religions was popular, so he used this, he used his political power for the sake of unity of his uh, Western and Eastern Roman Empire, so he mixed paganism with Christian terminology, and he came up with what today you call Christianity or ecumenical Christianity. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. And, so sad. And you know, you know what's really astounding is when you realize that when America first started, America banned Christ Christmas. Yes, Christmas I know. It was Puritan. not allowed. Right. It was not allowed. Yeah. It was, yeah. Was well, it in Massachusetts? Words, was it in Massachusetts, right? Yes. Yes. yes in Virginia they, and that whole area. And we, right. and we have gone downhill since then. Yes. Yes, because I was amazed, you know, last Christmas, I, 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 some of my friends who should know better, I just kind of said to him, I said, but you know, do you know that, oh, he says, you know, well, I know about God's holidays, but you know, I chose to keep Christmas, so he chose by, it's his authority to choose what to keep, all right? It's amazing what you people, with your freedom, what you have done with your freedom, Americans. You've, your freedom, yeah. you've given yourself liberty to choose You've given yourself authority to choose what you'll keep and what you'll not keep. My friends, that's not going to be, that's not going to end well at all. That's why the great tribulation is coming upon you. So God is going to remind exactly. you, and say, look, I'm the one, I'm the authority to tell you what you shall keep. Not you choosing and picking up, oh, we love Christmas and we love Halloween. What's, what is so, what's so Christian about Halloween? Just tell me what is so Christian. Can you imagine Jesus Christ? Walking in the, in the in the gospels, walking you know from door to door, asking for candy. Can you? Did you read every the the, the apostles would do that in Jerusalem? <laughs> Can you imagine that? 
Hey, I mean, common sense, my friends. Where is your common sense? The ruler of this world who will be deposed at the coming of Messiah, which is the great deep meaning of the wonderful uh, Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement, mm-hmm. the ruler has blackened your, 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 your minds to the point that you no longer even have a common sense. Tell me, where in the accounts of the early church did you, did you see any Christians, if you want to call them that way, or the followers of the way, or whatever you want to call them, followers of Yeshua, where have you seen, where did you see followers of Yeshua going from door to door, knocking on the door and asking for candy? Where did you see them yeah. masking into all of these obscure, terrible, grotesque, you know, uh, uh, creatures and figures? Where did you see an account of the early church Early Christian church keeping that. And you yeah, British and where, people. And yeah, where did you see them erecting trees? Yes. Where did you see and and direct trees? decorating the trees. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's in Jeremiah chapter 10. It's description of the so-called, it's called so-called Christmas. <laughs> <That's tree chapter. laughs> Go and right. read it. And, uh, and you British people, where in the world, you British people, uh, where in the world have you, have you, have you read it your, your, it certainly isn't his. Right. Have you read your history? Have you read your history? Have you read what day yeah. did the original church, Celtic church, British church keep in the first century? Have you read it? Oh, here in my library, the Hope of Israel, I've got now, thanks to this good friend, I've got now historical account of your early, all of your early Christianity in Britain. Surprise, surprise. The Venerable Bede and the, uh, what's the name of the other, the other author? What a wonderful names. Have you read them? Well, go, you know, do, blow the dust off those books, you know, go to your libraries, look for Venerable Bebe, look for the original accounts of the original Celtic British church. You'll be astounded. What did they keep? Even in the first and the second centuries, which day of rest did they keep? No, no, it wasn't the day of sun. It was the only true day of rest, Sabbath. So you British people certainly know which day is true. You see, unlike other Gentiles, you know, and you American people know, Gentile people are not educated as you are. But you just willfully and willingly are turning, like Gene said, you're turning, trying to get get away from Yehovah. No, you cannot get away from him because you're his people, whether you like it or not. And all of the material blessings that you had, like no other nations on the earth, have come from him. Because you're direct descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because God promised your ancestors that you'll have it. And now... And now those very things, those very gifts, those very wonderful, wonderful things that were given to us because of the righteousness of our ancestors are being taken from us because of our unrighteousness. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, what I'm saying about Britain and America, I'm saying I'm addressing them because they're leading tribes of Israel. But the same applies to you French and you Dutch and you Belgians and you uh, dwellers of the small, wonderful little state Luxembourg. The same applies to you, France. Have I missed anyone? Yeah, the same applies to you, Scandinavian country, Finland. Do you know who you are? Issachar. You carry two burdens between east and west. Russia is on the east, and Sweden was your enemy on the west. Swedish people. Naphtalites. Norwegians. The tribe of Benjamin. It's right. You look at the... Description of Benjamin, you know, he's, he somehow, he's so much loved by God, even though we know the Vikings, the descendants of, of, of Benjamin, and the, the ancestors of many Norwegians, were not really much like people anyway. <laughs> Before right, they came into contact right. with some missionary, a missionary was there who instructed them that they cannot do that, and then they calmed down, and then eventually became kind of docile people. <laughs> And Norway today is right. a kind of uh, interesting country. And Norway is, is not part of the European Union. That's number one. And number two, yeah. Norwegians are very wealthy people because their royal family was smart enough to uh, to do some good st- stuff. So each Norwegian, each 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 uh, subject of Norway family, Norwegian uh, royal house, is basically rich, fairly rich, amazing. So anyway, let's go back now to Isaiah 22. Uh, after we have warned <laughs> all Israel. Yes. Of what is coming. Yes, you French and others, you may not be taken to the concentration camps because the Germans don't hate you, <laughs> they hate British in America, but they may just enslave you economically. 
Just like what they happened to you, Swedish people, in the Second World War. You're paying off your liberty, your freedom, basically by selling steel to Hitler, you know. So the same will happen most likely to you in the coming years. But anyway, let's get back now to uh, uh, Isaiah 22. We have noticed in that prophecy that the damage will be great. You see, we read Isaiah 22, verse 6, 7, 8, all the way to uh, verse 11. We notice that the damage will be great, and we also notice the part of the reason will be because Israel, meaning the the, the state of Israel, uh, well, just like the house of Israel, <laughs> because Jewish people are not much different from the rest of the house of Israel, uh, the state of Israel will not truly look to its maker, which means that just relying on its own military will will not be enough. Now, we know one of these days, some of these times, somebody asked me, well, how can Britain be conquered because we have the greatest military, military might in Europe? And there are other people who say, oh, but look how much money America is giving for the, you know, for, 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 uh, uh, getting, you know, getting new weapons, developing its, its, mm-hmm. its military might and so on. My friends, uh, this human reasoning is really silly. If God says something, he's the ultimate authority. If he says that he's going to you know, destroy, the, the, the greatest fortress will be destroyed in the book of Daniel, the greatest force, mighty force will be certainly American army, it's going to happen. And secondly, secondly, speaking of America, your dollar is being printed without any, how should you call it, basis. You just keep printing dollars all the time. You know, what we hear from, I, I call Joseph Biden uh, Santa Claus, you know, because all the time you hear, oh, so many millions to Ukraine, help to Ukraine. So many millions, again, help to Ukraine. Oh, let's vote for another help package to Ukraine. I mean, where is that money coming from? Your money well, is being printed with, no, yeah, go ahead, Gene. Yes, it's the petrol dollar. Saying, I know, that's what. Every, what yeah, every yeah. dollar, every dollar that we print reduces the value of all the dollars printed before it. Right. You know, that's the eventually thing where, yeah, pretty soon uh-huh. it'll reach the point of being like toilet paper. Exactly, it'll be like toilet paper. And do yeah. you know some of the any when it happens that somebody is going to be willing to fight or go to military or whatever, your 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 society is being disintegrated. Your military right. is going to be disintegrated eventually as well. Morale of your, your military is already already. Oh, um, oh. what's the word? Uh, I'm looking for for a word, uh, not subverted, but um, uh, but something like that. Okay, I can't. Yeah, destroyed. In, in two languages, oh, yeah. in two languages, it's not very easy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but you're right. Yeah, it's sub- subverted. It's it's already being destroyed, uh-huh. undermined. I'm looking for the word undermined. There we go. Yes, that's right. Your military mm-hmm. might is already undermined, my dear friends. And when in America did military start to to go down? When you allowed what LGBT right. agenda in your military, right? And if you know, if you think that the rest of the world has no clue about it, you're very wrong. And if you think that the rest of the world loves your, what you're imposing to the rest of the world, no, people hate it, you know. Reason why America is being hated because you're trying to impose on people values that those people, people simply cannot accept. We cannot accept there are 36 or how many genders. I mean, my word. Is that common sense? How many are genders now? 16, 17, 37? I don't know. I mean, the latest, what is the latest date, date about it? I remember reading some of the, there was a conference in America they came up with about 30 genders. What in the world is wrong with you people? All I know we, is that Ye- Yehovah made us man and woman. Yes. And that's enough. That's enough. That's right. Uh, so, anyway. Uh, back now to, again, Isaiah 22. Don't worry, I know where I am at. So, uh, yes, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll continue. We have enough time yet to exhaust yes. that subject. So, uh, <laughs> some people have long believed that we may very well see a regional war as the state of Israel has, first of all, taken preemptive actions in the past against Iran. And secondly, said it would do so in the future to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear bomb. Uh, yes, some people believe it much before I did, but from this year, from this year, when, when I read that, uh, article in Jerusalem Post, all of a sudden I was, my conscience was awakened, my, my, my spiritual mind was awakened, and I'm like, yes, this seems to be possible, because before, I didn't see the city of David, you know, in Isaiah 22, mm-hmm. I didn't realize that Elam was not really referring to Slavic people, but it could refer to Iran. I didn't really realize that KIR is actually uh, uh, but some Syrians, some like, you know, you know, such a regional war 
it could trigger something that is prophesied in Daniel 9.27, and it's called the, we call it the peace deal. And it could also trigger those final three and a half years countdown until the start of the Great Tribulation, uh, which Mashiach mentioned in the book of Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew 24.21. Now, a uh, deal of Daniel 9.27, we'll come to that in uh, just few minutes, but I just uh, want to draw your attention to that. So, Isaiah 22 Daniel 9.27, and what it mean, may mean for us now, uh, or yeah. let's say for us several months down the road, or several years down the road, you yeah. see. Yeah. Because actually, actual and perceived threat from Israel are likely to trigger Iran, as well as Syria, to attack. And that might lead to that peace deal, as we call it, some of us call it, of Daniel 9.27. But at the same time, Iran is also expected to have devastations. Have you noticed, dear friends, Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 34? Jeremiah 49 and uh, verse 34. Look at this. Look at this. Verse 34, which says, which says, The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam, here is Elam, so it's Iran, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I'll break the bow of Elam, the chief of their might. The bow of Elam we traditionally uh, interpret it as the army, the army of Elam. And uh, many of us, uh, you see, former Yugoslavia, in which I was, the country I was born in, uh, used to be the fourth military might in the world in the 20th century. And because all the Yugoslav nations today, all these uh, republics now that formed former Yugoslavia, they're all descendants of Elam predominantly. And we always interpreted this here in this area as the uh, breakup of the very mighty former Yugoslav National Army, which was uh, the fourth might, uh, the fourth military might in the world. Uh, but obviously, I didn't realize that Elam refers also to Iran. So uh, now I look at this prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 49 in a different light. And verse 36, And upon Elam will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and will scatter them toward all those winds. And there shall be no nation whither the outcasts of Elam shall not come. For I'll cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before them that seek their life. And I'll bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I'll send the sword after them till I have consumed them. And I'll set my throne in Elam, and will destroy from thence the king and the princes, says the Lord. But it shall come to pass at the, in the latter days that I'll bring again the captivity of Elam, says the Lord. So I'm looking at this prophecy now in different light, my dear friends, because obviously it's not only, it might in part refer to former Yugoslavia, which was a very great military might uh, in the 20th century, but obviously we're now speaking about the future events. And uh, we see that Devastation is ahead for Iran. And this, it says, from multiple nations, because it's, it's mentioned from four, four uh, winds, four corners of the, of, the, of, the, of the world, verse 34. But perhaps, you know, mainly, their devastation may come from the nation that we call the State of Israel, because we know that the military might of the State of Israel is great and, 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 and fearsome. So a regional war, obviously, you see, will come to the Middle East, and it could be relatively soon. How soon, we don't know. But if you follow the Jewish press, and as I, I do when I have time, uh, enough time, well, to follow at least the Jerusalem Post, you can see that Iran is constantly the subject of their headlines. Now, I mentioned the peace mm-hmm. deal of Daniel 9, uh, verse 26 and 27. Okay, now this peace deal, as we call it peace deal, let's read it. Uh, in the past, I had totally misunderstanding of this, but now as the as we are approaching the end, I'm coming to realize how uh, how uh, much more clear and how some things that we thought that I thought were going to happen were now are now different and uh, have different meaning. And uh, yes, I'm very thankful to uh, my friend Bob Thiel, who is the doctor of natural medicine, by the way, and uh, I'm thankful to him for his great information, his vast knowledge about the church history. 
uh, his great knowledge about the uh, the biblical biblical prophecies as, as well, and he founded the Bible News Prophecy Prophecy Channel and things, so that we can be following up and being up to date with what is the current events. Now, Daniel nine. Let's read nine twenty six and twenty seven, so that you'll be now acquainted with that, friends. This is something that will be awaiting us down the road in several years, most likely. It says Daniel nine twenty six, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Well, this covenant, word covenant actually implies, obviously, peace, some kind of peace covenant, some kind of peace deal. So that's why we call it peace deal anyway. But he shall confirm covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, now, we know that one week has seven days. We also know from the Bible that there is a principle from Ezekiel, a day for a year. So right. this is obviously will be a peace deal that will be confirmed for one week for seven years. All right, mm-hmm. but you see, in the middle of the week, so after three and a half years, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Now, you may, under, you may re- remember that in Daniel, there is a uh, prophecy that the Jewish people are going to restore sacrificial Old Testament sacrificial system. Right. So, this one is going to end, you see, in the middle of the week, after three and a half years, when the deal is being confirmed, his deal, he's going to put an end to sacrifice and offering. In other words, he's going to occupy Jerusalem, that I referred uh, a few minutes ago to. I referred to that occupation of Jerusalem by the European armies. And, you know, he's going to put it on. And, and on the wing of abominations, here is the word abomination. Remember, I mentioned the desolation of abomination. On the wing of abominations, because those Europeans will be Catholics, you know. And the Catholic religion is full of abominations. I mentioned one of it. It's Easter Sunday. Right there from Ezekiel chapter 8. All the abomination of the Roman Catholic Church and the rest of the nominal Christianity, friends, is written in the Bible. It's written right there in the Torah. And God says, don't do that, don't be idolaters. And now they do it. The God says, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. But now the Israelites, Israelites grew worse and worse. And Israelites just wanted to serve God just like any other nation. Just like you today, Americans and British and French and West Europeans and Scandinavians, just like the rest of you. Today, you all want to be like others. Oh, you want to be like other nations. You know, you don't want to be God's people. <coughs> Why should you keep such a strange Yom Kippur day or such yeah. a strange a feast, strange is my Torah to, to my people. It says, the, I think it says, Prophet Hosea says that. Strange, yes, I know it's strange to you. It's strange because you don't want to be God's people, you want to be pagans. If you were humble enough to say, okay, let's see what is really written in this book, and let's see what is really God telling us how we're to live, it wouldn't be so strange to you. But no, it's strange to you because you're now filled with all kinds of pagan customs and pagan ideas and, 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 and pagan uh, terminology and pagan theories including evolution and Darwinism. Yeah. Uh-huh. And not only that, not only, not only that, but it's uncomfortable. We don't like discomfort. Oh, yes. We like comfort. You know, right. we, we, don't want, we right. don't want to have to sacrifice our comfort, our ease. Yes. Yes. We don't like that. We, we want to, all that stuff we can throw out, and we'll just keep the stuff that's easy and nice and fun. And fun, yes. And that's, um, Let's have entertainment all the time. Well, my dear friends, life is very entertaining. So those of you who want to be waving your hands and praising the Lord all the time in heaven will not have that. You'll have much more, <laughs> much more greater entertaining fun down here on the earth. You'll see it. That's right. That's right. So the, 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 the says, uh, the verse 27, and the wings of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, but until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So this is Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, which some of us call peace deal because we say that this covenant will be a peace deal. So from this, what I've just read in Daniel, we learn that a deal, which is called a covenant, will be confirmed for one prophetic week, meaning seven years. And then it will be broken in the middle by one referred to as a prince. Now, this is a prince of the group that was also prophesied to destroy the city of Jerusalem, as verse 26 points to. And this destruction was done, as I said already historically, by the Roman Empire in 70 AD, which is, at which at the time dominated Europe and had European soldiers, you see. So we have now a prophecy about the European army. And what is happening in Europe right now? 
there is a formation of the being pushed by Germany. It's formation of the European army. Because they say, oh, Russia is our big threat. So we need to now build, we need to cut the budget and we need to spend more money on, on, on developing military might. We need to develop an army, European army that will be commanded by, by who? Well, by Germans, of course. Now to those of you who know anything from history, this would ring the bell. Ring the bell. And yes. in Deuteronomy 28, there is a prophecy to you, my dear house of Israel, which says that uh, as a swift eagle, army of people with strange language, whose language you do not understand is going to come. They're not going to have any mercy on children or on elderly, and they're going to completely destroy. Now, the only countries in Europe that have eagle, in fact, black eagle on their flags, are two countries. Guess which one? Germany and Austria. Does that ring the bell to some of you? Especially you older generation who should, perhaps some of you who will <coughs> remember what was the Second World War and who caused the Second World War and what caused the Second World War does this. But this time, my dear friends, there will be no might to resist. This is a prophecy from Deuteronomy 28 that like a swift eagle, it's going to come and destroy you. Because your economy will be devastated, the dollar will be worth the, the toilet paper, your morale is terrible, and you want to be pagans, British and Americans. You don't want to be God's people. No, you want to be pagans, just like other nations. And because you want to be pagans, then pagan nations, you know, with black eagle, all black eagles on their flags, are going to come and enslave you. Because Germans are uh, in very much originators of much of paganism. They were one of the most paganized <laughs> nations, nations in the world, by the way. But you do not know that because you were not, you were not, you know, much educated and much interested in other people. But one thing you should be interested in and you should know, only one thing. If there is one nation that they hate so much, it's you English people. If there is another nation which they hate so much, it's you Americans. Because you conquered them twice in the Second World War. And of course you had your allies. One of your most faithful allies in both World, War, World Wars was a little country on the Balkans called Serbia. The little country on the Balkans called Serbia is right now being under terrible pressure and being constantly bullied by who? Well, by Germany, of course. By Austria, of course. We're being bullied to, you know, impose sanctions on our traditional friend, Russia. We're being bullied to uh, allow a part of our territory to secede contrary to the international law. We're being bullied into all kinds of things by those things. They're bullying us now. They've destroyed, they've destroyed a big country called Yugoslavia, which was one of the most beautiful and uh, very prosperous country. They've destroyed that. They've destroyed now, they're now pressuring on Serbia. They do everything that they can, they can to undermine Serbia in every way, economically, politically, diplomatically, and so on. But they hate you. Yes. Do do I do I remember correctly that the Germans are succeeded from uh, from the uh, Assyrians? Assyrians? Yes. Yeah, yes. Exactly. Yes. 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 Exactly. Yes. Assyrians are their ancestors, and if you look back into Bible history, as you know it, in the Bible history, who was the one who destroyed the Northern Kingdom of Israel? Not the Jewish Assyrians. people. The Jewish people who were later destroyed yeah. by the Nebuchadnezzar and Babylonians, but the Northern Kingdom was destroyed by. Assyria. Assyria, yeah. So, dear friends in America, Britain, and Northwest Europe, history is going to repeat itself. Exactly. The, the, the word that I, I hear, the thing that I think of is, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yes. Oh, <laughs> indeed. They stay the same. But this time is going to be much worse. Yes. So usually when, yes. When, 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 when something prophesied happens again, it's usually much worse than it what happened the first yes. time. Exactly. So this time is going to be horrendous. What happened to the House of Judah in the Second World War by at the hands of the Nazis, again, the descendants of Assyria, is going exactly to happen to all of you people in Britain and America yes. and New Zealand and Canada and Australia. In other and words, I, the Second I, I Holocaust. I grieve to say that, but... Huh? A Second Holocaust? Yes, but this yeah. time, like you said, I think if you, you termed it, it'll be Holocaust of Ephraim, right? Right. Right. Because Ephraim is the leading leading tribe in the ten tribes. Ephraim. Who is Ephraim? You English people. You English people with your unofficial anthem, 
that speaks about, mentions Jerusalem, mentions somebody walking on this pleasant land. Who would be somebody walking on your pleasant land? Well, obviously it's Jesus Christ, because you're having Glastonbury, the house that says, the house of Joseph of Arimathea and Jesus Christ. And do you know that many, many uh, various uh, disciples of Jesus Christ in the first century fled where? Well, right there to you, Britain. My dear Britain, what has happened to you, British people? You've given your, you've, 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 you've substituted your, 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 the awareness of your, of your origin with, with, with pagan things. You want to be like other people. How sad, how sad, how, how sad. Yes, I'm telling you this. I'm a Serbian, but I'm telling you this. Instead of being proud, instead of being healthily proud of who you are and singing and, 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 and serving the Lord with all gladness of heart in abundance, I'm quoting Deuteronomy, by the way, which says, since you did not want to, to serve your God, the Lord your God with all gladness, with gladness of your heart in abundance, then you shall be given to these pagans and then you'll be, you'll be serving their gods. Well, that's what is going to happen to you, my dear English people. Instead of being healthily proud of who you are, instead of embracing your identity and saying, well, we are, we are Israel. Instead of saying, okay, well, God of Israel demands that we do this, that, and the other. Let's change our wrong, pagan, terrible ways. No. No, you just go your own way, do your own things, because you think you have authority to rule your life as you wish. Well, God is going to show you, God is going to show you that you have no authority. And I'm going to quote one of my friends from England who told me once. You see, with Ephraim, he says, you first have to, you have to push him straight uh, to, to uh, against the wall. Once he's back against the wall and Ephraim has nothing, no other way, then Ephraim is going to repent and Ephraim then is going to call upon God. Well, my dear English friends, that's exactly what is going to happen with you. When you have your, you, you are going to have your backs rise against the wall because very soon this United States of Europe with its German, German-led European army is going to slam international sanctions against you and against America and against Australia and against New Zealand. And you know what that means, because when you will be cut off from supplies, many of you are so dependent on drugs. And who is the major European drug producer, Gene? What do you think? Who would be the one? Hmm. Yeah, who could be the one? The one is from Germany, by the way. Yeah. It's a famous mark called Bayer. Oh, yeah. And he is yep, the major, yep, yep. yeah, he would be the major supplier of so-called medicine. And so many of you are dependent on medicine, your English people. When, 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 when those drugs are cut off, a third of you are going to die from it. Look at your land that you have polluted, the beautiful land God has given you. You have polluted with GMOs, rubbish. Shame on you. You are the leading nation, Great Britain, of all the nations to say, oh, we need GMO. GMO is going to uh, increase our crops and all that. Shame on you. When, they'll, when, when the drought comes, there's a horrible drought prophecy in Deuteronomy 28. When the drought comes, all of that GMO crops is not going to yield any, any, any fruit. Any, any, any crops will not. The GMO is not going to yield any crop. And you'll be starving because of your silly, godless choices. God gave you uh, the first organic movement I ever encountered was in England, by the way. Uh, even in the day, that will be like the last century, the end of the last century, the end of the 20th century, when I didn't even know what was GMO at that time. But yeah. I encountered the, uh, the, 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 the there was uh, one of my friends who was part of that organic movement, and I thought, well, what in the world is, why, why would they have organic movement? I didn't realize. Well, because their government was actually polluting polluting their land with all kinds of rubbish even back then. And then with the invention of GMO rubbish, they have com- completely polluted the whole country. Shame of you, British government. You have destroyed what God has given you. God has given you a safe place. He says, place, how does it say? Uh, 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 a high place where you'll be safe from all of your enemies. And look what you have done with your country, polluted with the GMO, polluted with its, your disgusting customs. You've so degenerated that, you know, when I was in your land, when I hear about child abuse, I was horrified. I never heard of that in any Gentile country, the way the children are being abused. Right. In all these pagan countries, I've never heard children being abused the way that they're abused in your country. Shame on you. And you think right. that God is going to look for it, you know, down from heaven? Oh, he's up there in heaven, far away from us. We can, you think God is going to look and, and allow that to go on forever and ever? No, he will not. No, certainly he will not. 
so uh, back now to the <laughs> peace deal, if we will, <laughs> future peace deal in the Middle East. Now, the Middle East is going to, of course, uh, shake and send the shockwaves to the rest of the world because the Middle East was always considered to be the powder cake, you know, the powder keg, you know, that's only going to explode. And uh, uh, basically in the last century, at least, uh, if you would ask nations around the world what was the greatest threat to international peace and security, many would say Middle East, you know. They would not say Russia or Ukraine or (laughs) whatever. They would say Middle East. So this prince of Daniel 9.26 would need to be a European, of course, a European, because, you know, it's the those who destroyed Jerusalem and occupied Jerusalem in 70 AD were Romans or Europeans. And it was a likely one with connection to what was later known as the Holy Roman Empire. In fact, he would most likely be a descendant of a Holy Roman Emperor. Now, normally, princes have slight influence, as you all know, but no major power until they become kings. And most princes do not become kings. Nevertheless, in the, this prince that we have just read in Daniel does become a king. If you notice Daniel 11.27, notice Daniel 11.27, he becomes king. So he's no longer prince, he becomes prince, king. Now, uh, let's first read that in 27. And both these kings' hearts shall do this with king of the north, king of the south, it will be king of the north. Kings' hearts shall uh, be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper. But yet, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. He's also mentioned in verse, I think, 31 and verse 40 as be, becoming a king. Verse 31 says... Uh, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, again, you see, occupation of Jerusalem, and they shall place the abomination that makes desolate, which I refer to brands already, and such will do wickedly, then verse 40 says, and at the end, time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, that will be the Arab confederation, and the king of the north, and north of Jerusalem is always Europe, European Union now, shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So we have this, we have this now in the prophecy that this prince of ours becomes king. Let me, let me give you a possible scenario. Now let's say he is uh, of a lesser political position. Let's say he is a diplomat. Uh-huh. Diplomat of European Union. Let's say he is being sent by the European Union, uh, to, to broker this peace deal. And then, of course, because of the merits of, you know, saving the world from possible world conflict and bringing peace to Middle East, all of a sudden he becomes so popular. So instead of being prince, he is now, uh, he advances to being a king. A king. So you'll have to be, uh, yes, tyrant. Exactly. That's the prime word. Yes. He becomes tyrant. So he becomes no longer prince. He's now a king. He has to have a power. He has to have a, a office over a uh, over a uh, mighty, uh, uh, over a state, okay, uh-huh. because he's a king now, he's a ruler. What if he becomes the president of the United States of Europe? Huh. You see, mm-hmm. from being a prince, he becomes king. So a leader who was once disregarded is also prophesied to be that prince and later king. There is a prophecy about him. Look at his, uh, this is his biography, we might say, this is Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. And there shall stand up in his place one despised, and the kingly honor shall not be given him, and he shall come privately, and shall obtain the kingdom by fraud. (laughs) This sounds, those who know history, sounds a little bit like Hitler, you know. He had a little, he had some, you know, kind of private meetings in that beer uh, beer cafe, and then you know, with a small band of his supporters, he basically the Weimar Republic kind of gave up, and the old German president Hindenburg withdrew. He kind of, you know, he kind of stepped down you know, quietly, and then Hitler came in by fraud. The, in um, in another rendering, the Bible in contemporary language, it says his place will be taken by a reject, a man spurned and passed over for advancement. He'll surprise everyone, seemingly coming out of nowhere, and will seize the kingdom. Ha, interesting. Then we have another 
Red Ring, which says this is uh, America's standard version, and in his place shall stand up a contemptible person to whom they had not given the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in time of security and shall obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Time of security, because, you know, when a peace deal is brokered in the Middle East, oh, the people say, oh, finally, no longer threat for the world, peace and the destruction of the world, oh, no, peace, peace and peace, in the time of peace, he advances from being prince into being king. Well, dear friends, there is a man right now, right now there is a man who once held political offices who might be considered as a prince. It's a former economics minister. Then he was defense minister of which country? Surprise, surprise. Germany. Germany. He was despised because he, it was discovered in 2011, I think, that he was, he made, uh, uh, that his doctorate was fraudulent or that he was, uh, what was the name? What was the term for that? Uh, plagiarism. Yes. Yeah. That his yeah. doctorate was plagiarized. Wow. He withdrew, yeah, he was then, in, in that way we can say that he was despised, contemptible, you see. In the past in Germany that would cause, uh, it would be the end of somebody's political career. It, in the past in any country, I think even in America that would be the end of political career of a person, but no, not for this man. Not for this man. He emigrated to the United States in New York. He founded a financial company. After that he returned to, uh, to, to his homeland, but uh, I remember reading uh, last year in December when he it was his birthday, December 5th, by the way. He was born in 1972. He's one year younger than I. And uh, it was reported that by the German press uh, that the current German government is so weak that they would need a strong person like him. He was supposed to be the uh, uh, successor of Angela Merkel, but because of this plagiarism scandal, he basically, you know, fell off he was <laughs> he was uh, rejected as her successor. So then we have this this creature called Olaf Scholz, you know, who Germans hate so much because now because of the sanctions against Russia, he tells Germans that they cannot wash their hands more than I don't know how many minutes. That they should not that they should curb on their hygiene. They should not be showering more than perhaps twice a week and all that stupid things that you know you, you wouldn't believe that a, you wouldn't believe that any politician would say that. I mean, if if he said this like. Ten years ago, people probably booed him out and, and, and voted him out. But, you know, he's now using this this this, this fear of Russia and, and he's spreading and, uh, all kinds of stupid ideas. But anyway, anyway, he was not supposed to be, uh, Olaf Scholz was not supposed to be the successor of Angela Merkel. It was this man, this man who was the Minister of Defense, Minister of Economy. His full name, I'm going to read now, is Baron. You see, he has a... He has a title. Baron Karl Theodor Maria Nikolaus Johann Jakob Philipp Franz Josef Sylvester Freiherr von Unzu Gutenberg. American press calls him KT, Karl Theodor. Uh, recently he became a political commentator of RTL. It's RTL is a European mm -hmm. television network. Uh, that happened like a month ago. All of a sudden, he becomes political commentator. Why? Well, because, you know, he was in outstanding posts in Germany. He was supposed to be Angela Merkel's uh, successor. And guess what? During his political career, he was already invited numerous times to be a mediator and be involved with Iran and Iranian nuclear program. He rejected it nevertheless, or he, well, or perhaps he didn't reject it, but he was involved because, uh, unlike many other Germans, he speaks perfect English language. Uh, he has international experience. Many Germans do not. And uh, he's regarded as a good politician, you see. And now, by being a political commentator, he's making his way back, you know. And in this article of December last year, uh, the conclusion of the article said, before this man, there is a bright future. And I said to myself, they don't even know what they have said. Yes, they don't even know who he is. But I should suppose, I'm supposed to know who he is. We, dear friends, are supposed to know who he is. KT, commonly referred to as KT, Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg. Yes, look for him, look for him. Yeah, you can find him online. But you now, unlike Hitler, he's not as ugly. He's not, he's so sleek. He's so kind of good looking, you know. 
So the deception will be even greater. You know, Hitler was like a screaming, screaming, ugly, ugly person <laughs> that nobody could like, other than deceived Germans who were, when you look at the uh, uh, video recordings, many of them had these enlarged, enlarged eyes, you know, obviously demonized. But KT is a different kind of person. He's, by the way, he's a descendant of Leopold II, who was the Holy Roman Emperor in the late 18th century. Does that ring the bell? He's already mm. descendant of Leopold II. I think through his maternal side. So he does have this title. And interestingly enough, Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg, dear friends, as I said, was considered to have had a major chance to become Chancellor of Germany before a plagiarism scandal in 2011. And in a sense... Uh Yes. By the way, you, you, you do know who the major, the, the primary plagiarist is in the United States, right? Oh, you need to remind <laughs> me. <laughs> Joe Biden. Oh, Joseph yes. Biden. Oh, tell me that name. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, astounding. astounding. Just tell me that name. Well, but, but, you know, think, it's, it's all about, you know, it's, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Right, right. Well, I think he'll have a very good counterpart if he stays into power, which I hope he does not. If he does yeah. stay too far, yeah. very soon he'll have a very good counter European counterpart, because you see, yes. uh, he was the main candidate for to become Chancellor of Germany. But you know, in a sense, you see how the prophecy describes him well. He was a man spurned and passed over for advancement, as wow. the you know version one version of Daniel eleven twenty one indicated. And some also may find the following. There is a one Greek Orthodox prophecy of one called the Great Monarch. It's interesting. I'm just going to tell you one. Uh, well, I, I'm thinking, you know, we were thinking these days, some of us who consider the Bible, uh, if John was shown in the vision all kinds of things in the book of Revelation, the good question is, has the Satan and his demons, have they been shown also the same things, you know? Yes. Which means that they would, you know, I mean, the book of James, the the the, the brother of the, of the Lord, as he says, uh, he says that uh, demons know and tremble. <laughs> so, yes. you know, if, which means why I'm saying that, well, because I believe that nominal Christianity, of course, which is a Constantine, great Constantine religion, nothing more than that, and Constantine was obviously a man uh, who was deceived by Satan, the ruler of this world, uh, which means that some of the prophecies of these Nominal Christians that are obviously not inspired by the eternal. Uh, could those prophecies be really true? Because demons have seen possibly what John was was shown in the book of Revelation. So I'm going to read to you one Greek prophecy. Greek was a prophecy. Uh, there is an uh, anonymous paraphrasis. It was written in the 10th century. Uh, and it says, Men thought of him that he is a nobody and useful for nothing of that great coming monarch, you see. And, uh, yeah. Now, many, when that scandal broke out in 2011, many wrote Baron Gutenberg off. See? But also, interestingly, even though many have rejected and ridiculed and even despised him for plagiarism, after he resigned from his post in Germany, some have suggested that he should rise up again as Germany needs him. And that was in this article of December the 5th last year, published last year. The um, the author of the article said, well, you know, we would need somebody decisive, somebody knowledgeable. We need somebody like Karl zu Gutenberg. He was writing an article about him, uh, giving some biographical data, saying that he's very wealthy, that he lives in Munich. By the way, Munich, Bavaria. Bavaria is the most Catholic part of Germany. Those of you who don't know, the uh, northern part of Germany basically is uh, is anti-Catholic, especially Hamburg. But the southern part of Germany, Bavaria, is very Catholic. But at the same time, let us be very honest and let us be um, true to historical data. I watched the um, survey or the uh, the results of when it was the when there were there were elections when Hitler won. I have to tell you, my friends, that the, the, the Catholic areas of Germany did not vote for Hitler. The overwhelming vote for Hitler was in the Protestant called in the Lutheran areas. Luther was a terrible anti Semite. Ah, he was right. quoted by Hitler as well. And Lutherans, yes, I have to tell you this is true, 
and the Germans may be surprised to find it. But I, I watched the, uh, the, 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 the diagram, diagram showing the, uh, who voted for Hitler. I have to tell you the terrible truth. The Protestants, so-called Protestants, Lutherans, voted greater number. Hitler came into power because of Lutheran votes, not because of the Catholic votes, by the way. And that's historical right. fact we need to know. Which means that the Lutherans were anti-Semites, that the Lutherans were haters of the Jews as well, and it means that they were, they were just willing to embrace Nazi ideology. Which shows to us again that, you know, being a Protestant does not make you much different, especially not now in this day and age when we have ecumenical movement and all of this, all of these fraternal churches have come together. You know, it's like in Revelation 17. Babylon, mother and daughters, you know, here is the mother church, Mother Church of Rome, right. and they are their Protestant daughters who just left her protesting about this, that, and the other. But now, in the 21st century, they've all come back to mommy. So we have this, wow. this, 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 this alliance, yes, of mother and daughters being so-called Christianity. And we all, oh, we have one common thing, you know, they would say, well, we all believe in Jesus. No, we all believe in Holy Trinity, you know. That's one yeah. thing that's, you know, that, well, are those of us who don't believe in Trinity, and there are plenty of us, and I think among our audience, there are plenty of those who don't believe in Trinity sure. because it's pagan, it has nothing to do with the Bible. We are, right. dear friends, written off, and we are only targeted to be persecuted and exterminated. You need to know that. You need to know that. And uh, you need to give up on your, I've said so many times to my fellow believers, you need to give up on this idea of your uh, privacy, security, and safety. Don't be dumb. Uh, the former Catholic Jesuit, Alberto Rivera, there are several art, there are several articles and several interviews with him online. He said that even in the 80s, Vatican had a huge computer with data about all the world population and who was very much targeted and who was kind of singled out for persecution and possible <laughs> extermination were those who did not believe who are not Catholics and those who did not believe in the Trinity and those who believed in the Sabbath and the holidays and those who followed Jesus Christ, yes. Oh, yes, indeed, my dear friends. So nothing you under heaven, they're all spying upon us. Uh, and uh, those of us, several years ago I've heard that those of us who believe in the coming restoration of this earth that Gene and I refer to on several occasions in this interview... Those of us who believe in the millennium, as we call it popular, because it'll be 1,000 years of restoration of this wonderful planet. Those of us who believe that we are kind of um, conspiracy theorists and we are dangerous for the system, so we should be washed. And there was even a special program, my dear Americans, designed in America to follow our email correspondence and so on. I've just forgotten now what was the name of the program, but I'll, I'll remember it. It was a spying program to spy on us and our correspondence. Uh, it was called, I'll remember it, uh, I can't remember it right now, but I know it was there. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, okay. uh, back to our Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg. So even though many rejected, ridiculed, and despised him for plagiarism, after he resigned, some suggested that he should rise up again as Germany needs him. And about a month ago, I think, or a couple of months ago, he became... Uh, the uh, political commentator of one of the very popular European television networks. Now, despite being out of public office, uh, Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg has shown repeated public interest in political matters, including Iran, you see, including Iran. And we, here in Serbia, believers have researched a little bit and we have realized that he was on several occasions involved in matters, international matters related to Iran, especially to Iranian uh, nuclear 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 uh, program. Now, again, you need to realize that this person has had previous high-level involvement looking at one or more possible peace deals between Israel and its geographic neighbors. Back in February 2011, there is a there is a United Nations document online, and uh, it says the United Secretary General, the question of Palestine, sec general activities in Germany, third to sixth February 2011. So I have a, I have a, uh, here a link to that site. If you're interested, I can send it to you. And uh, okay. I'm thankful to my friend Bob Thiel, who has been watching and writing about this person since 2009. And uh, 
because certain of his actions and what has happened to his career and the fact that many things he wrote that he could do have been indeed fulfilled. There is a, there are articles out there about that. I won't go into details now, but I myself was indeed aware of this person, but I was kind of cautious and kind of reluctant a little bit to mention his name until very recently because I was thinking, okay, if he's the one, then we're going to see it when the time comes. Because, friends, make sure, when this regional prophesied nuclear war between Iran and the State of Israel breaks out, whoever will be sent by the Europeans to be the peace broker, that person, for sure, will be the European dictator. Because he's going to bring, bring the, yeah, he's going to eliminate potential threat to the world peace, and he's going to be regarded then as a savior of human, humanity, you know. And they're going mm-hmm. to be saying, peace, peace. Remember First Thessalonians chapter 5, peace, peace. When they say peace, peace, sudden destruction comes upon them. Well, yes, the whole world will be saying, oh, peace, peace, wonderful peace. This person is going to break this, break this peace deal in the middle of the week. So after three and a half years, and then suddenly, you know, sudden destruction will come upon the world. So I thought, well, okay, whoever will be the broker, peace broker, will be the European dictator, that's for sure. But brethren, as, 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 as time develops, unlike my friend Bob Hill who says, we are going to see, I'm now convinced that this Carl Theodor to Gutenberg will be the one. I'm convinced because uh, I might be wrong. If I'm wrong, I'll repent, of course. If it's not him, I'm going to tell you it's not him. Uh, but, you know, I'm speaking to you now as um, very honestly. I should, you know, I should probably be cautious and say it might be him. But for some reason, I feel it's him. And if it's not, I'll repent again. If it's not, you'll forgive me. I'll repent. But whoever is the peace broker between Iran and the State of Israel, that will be the European dictator. I'm convinced more and more that this, this is this person because his biography simply fits so well the Bible description. Uh, what we have right. just read from Daniel, just this, his biography fits it. Secondly, he speaks perfect English. Unlike Angela uh, Merkel, who could, he speaks perfect English. He speaks it even with good British accent. He was in New York. He, uh, he, he founded a, co- a financial company in New York. Uh, you can find it online. <laughs> I think somebody was looking for that and said, look, I mean, there is no, there is no address listed for his company, but at least it's there. It's registered in New York. So he knows about you Anglo-Saxon people. He knows your language. He knows your mentality. He knows economics. He was a minister of economics. He was a minister of defense involved into the army. And Germany is right now developing the army. Uh, he was despised because of his plagiarism, but he's now coming kind of back. There is obviously a circle of people who do support him because the, uh, this uh, German author, German journalist of the last year, wrote a brilliant article about him. What really, and that article was perhaps the moment when I said to myself, uh, yeah, it's, I'm convinced it's him. Because why? I'm realizing, Ben, if, uh, if a secular journalist could write about this once despised and rejected man, that there is a bright future for him. If a secular journalist can, find, can write it, obviously based on knowledge that he has about him or based on who knows what kind of information he has about him. Well, if a secular journalist can write it, then how can I, who read the Bible prophecy, how can I, who are spreading, me spreading the word, you know, uh, word to you, trying to interpret the prophecies faithfully to you, how can I ignore it? Right. If there are calls, you know, small calls right now that he should return to the politics, the Germans, the, well, just look at this current German Chancellor, Olaf Scholz. He's not even even the shadow of Angela Merkel. You know, with Angela Merkel, at least you had some feeling of authority, feeling of, you know, a, a woman which commanded respect, you know. This right. man, Olaf Scholz, he, he's booed all the time because he keeps spreading these stupid speeches to German people. They should, you know, curb on how much they take showers per week because they, you know, because they're, there'll be gas shortages because of the sanctions against Russia. Many Germans hate it because a part of German economy does depend on Russia, especially car industry. And you can just imagine how that is affecting the Germans. The, the food prices, the fuel prices have gone up all over the world, including Germany. And you look at that person when he comes. He just looks like a little cloud. 
compared even to Angela Merkel. So Germans at one point, I'm sure Germans, knowing German mentality, Germans at one point will say, we've had enough of this clown. We need a strong hand. We need somebody who is internationally experienced. We need somebody who will lead this nation forward. And most likely it will be this man, Karl Theodor II Gutenberg. And after mm-hmm. a likely war between Iran and the State of Israel, probably involving Syria, according to what we have just read, Syria and others, a peace deal will take place, my dear friends. A peace deal will take place. And Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg looks to be the one who could be the prince that confirms the deal for a prophetic week as foretold in Daniel chapter 9. And between the time the deal is confirmed and before it is halfway over, Europe will reorganize into a totalitarian super state. Yes, Gene, you felt it right. It will be a despot, a totalitarian re- leader. A totalitarian super state, Revelation 17, verse 12 and 13. The ten horns, which you saw, are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. And the beast is, of course, the European dictator. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. So Europe will between, you know, the deal being confirmed, and before it's halfway over, will reorganize into a totalitarian state. A total full power will, give, will be given to this man. So he'll be the chief of staff of the coming European army. He'll be the political leader, and... Uh, According to, I uh, will speak about that sometimes later, perhaps when this regional war breaks between Iran and, 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 and Israel. And this man, according to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, is called the son of perdition, uh, the man of sin, son of perdition. He will be obviously helping his power by false miracles. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And the leader of this super state, of this United States of Europe, my dear Israelites, uh, horrible, he's going to then, we'll be talking about the Great Tribulation in details later, he's going to one, when he breaks this peace deal, he's going to enact, he's going to start the Great Tribulation. Against you, the House of Judah, against you, British, Americans, Northwest Europeans, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. I, I plead with you, if you love God, Still, God of Israel, if you still want to embrace your identity, it's not too late. Your nations will most likely not repent, but some individuals among you, some of you living and listening to this, hopefully, will understand how serious all of this is. And the leader of this super state, European Union, will proclaim peace, you know. But there is prophecies, you see, his biography is prophesied already in the book of Daniel. He'll proclaim peace, but he'll devise military plans. Look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. Let's go to Daniel 8, verse 25. Daniel 8, 25 says, And through this, through his policy, also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the Prince of Princes, who is the Prince of Princes, of course, the coming Messiah, but he shall be broken without hand. So that's the man, you see. The European dictator, the one who will be the brokering brokering peace in the Middle East, will be the one to stand up against our, our coming Messiah. Look at also Daniel chapter 11, verse 23. Daniel 11. Verse 23 and 24. Look at the, the uh, here is another uh, prophecy about him. And I'm telling you all of this ahead of time, my dear friends. We'll be looking, we'll be watching all of this with our own eyes. Hopefully by then, if those of you, some of you listening to this, hopefully then some of you might wake up and say, yeah, look, the Bible is truly the word of God. The only authority of our lives. The book of the house right. of Israel from the beginning to the end. And God of Israel is here. He wants the best for us, but we have gone astray like evil children, like that bad, um, like that prodigal son. We've come, we, we, we've strayed away, but yes, we can come back. The Father is waiting for us in the middle of the road, waiting for us, the house of Israel, to come back and to return. And you know what? In the Jewish tradition, it was extreme shame to lift up your garments and run. But this is what, in the, in the story of the prodigal son, that's exactly what the father did, you know. So, house of Israel, God is waiting for you. 
or at least for some of you now to repent. But the rest of you, those of you who survived this great horrible tribulation, those of you who survived the other prophecies in the Bible, we'll be talking about that hopefully in some other, we'll have more time in some other interview. Hopefully, yeah. those of you who repent, you'll finally find true peace, true security, true safety. But look, in the meantime, Daniel eleven twenty three, 23, the prophecy about this coming European dictator. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably, even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's father. He shall scatter among them the prey, the spoil, and riches. Yeah, he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. So, meanwhile, there's a peace deal in, in place. This evil man will be plotting, devising military plans, which will be very successful. We can read that in, in Daniel chapter 11. If you continue reading 30, verse 39 through 43, his plans will be successful when he unleashes them, when he breaks that peace deal in the middle. And prior to this reorganization, this beast leader does not have much power, but with a small group backing him, he will attain it. It says in Daniel 11, 23, we have just read it, you see. Something similar to Hitler, that he'll be much more likable than Hitler. And when the temporary peace deal is in place... The following prophecy is expecting to be fulfilled. The one that I just mentioned, First Thessalonians 5, verse 3. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Because, brethren, people will think it's time of peace. They will think all of their world problems are over because the Middle East, the greatest powder keg, the uh, greatest threat to world peace is now at peace, you know. And... Uh, People think that's it. Great prosperity, peace. You know, Europe is going, well, according to what we read in the prophecy, the European Union, the European Union might reach the level of prosperity even higher than America. Because even yeah. right now, the European market is much larger. It's all larger than America. And the European, European uh, uh, influence has been growing all around the world. So, there'll be peace. There'll be plenty of money. Oh, people, oh, there's plenty of money. People have always... A way to pay for their sins, so there'll be increase in sins and all kinds of things. People will be saying peace and safety, nothing will happen to us, wonderful. And then he says, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon pregnant women, and they shall not escape. So people will think it's right. time of peace, it's time of, uh, it's, 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 it's what we dreamed all. Oh, look, this prosperity, peace, everything is great, and yet it will end up in the time of birth, in the time of birth pangs, as Mark, yes. the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verse 8 says, and it's also known as the Great Tribulation, my dear friends. We haven't talked about the Great Tribulation perhaps for a long time, or for Jacob's, or about Jacob's trouble. Yes. Great Tribulation yes. prophesied by Jesus Christ in the Gospels, and Jacob's trouble prophesied in the book of uh, Jeremiah, chapter 7. It will be, as Jesus Christ says, the most horrible place, uh, the, well, not right. place, but the most horrible uh, event ever. But the problem that many of you have, my dear friends, problem that many of you have, even those of you who keep the commandments of God, you have, many of you have one huge problem. You do not believe that it will be that horrible. You simply cannot imagine, you cannot fathom that horror, and therefore, deep down in your mind and heart, you actually don't believe Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ said in the Gospels, that will be the worst time ever. Yeah. You don't and believe the worst time that would ever be. Yes, the worst time be. that would ever be as well. Yeah, right. So you don't believe actually Jesus Christ. Those of you who think that you do, even you who keep the commandments of God, no, you don't believe him. His words are it's with that horror because, but, but because you cannot fathom that horror right now in all this prosperity and this kind of system, you think, oh no, no, it can't, it can't be that bad. Yes, it will be that bad. And your minds are so brainwashed that, you know, in the, in the letter to Laodicea, in his address to Laodicea, he knocks on the door and he says, you know, if anyone hears me and opens the door, you know. Because many of you, my dear friends, cannot fathom that this is horrible. But I tell you, from the Bible, it will be horrible. I, I'm from a nation that, that experienced two genocides in the last century by, at the hands of Germans and Austrians. Yes. So I know how horrible it can be. The Jewish people can tell you how horrible it can be, but the, Jesus Christ says it will be even worse. 
why it will be worse. Perhaps the proportion of of of, of genocide will be much worse. Uh, um, who knows what? I mean, and you cannot imagine it right now. And then because of you cannot imagine it, many of you think, well, it's not. It, it's not going. To, it's not really going to be that bad. Yes, it will be that bad. It will be that bad. It will be that horrible. And we and have to you understand. Yes, we've got. You, we have to understand. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Yes. Sorry. Because you because and because you cannot fathom it, you become actually lukewarm. You know, you become lukewarm. Yes. Just, just like it says in the Bible. Again, the words of Jesus Christ. It's a prophecy again that they'll be lukewarm. Lukewarm. It will be lukewarm, regardless of who you are. You might be Protestants. You might be Catholics. You might be you, you might be uh, commandment keepers. You might be Messianics. Many of you are so lukewarm because you first of all you you have some wrong ideas and wrong, wrong religious convictions. But secondly, you do not believe that very soon, very soon, after this peace deal that will be struck in the Middle East, very soon, three and a half years after that, we're going to wait. We're, we're going to be engulfed by the Great Tribulation, the worst time ever, yeah. according to the words of your Mashiach. Now also, and, those, and, and that's uh-huh. happening. That is happening as a punishment. We have to remember Yes. This is not something Yehovah just sort of, you know, he, he, you know, he turned the wheel of fortune and it ended up pointing at, at right. tribulation and he said, okay, sorry, but you guys are going to get tribulation. We're getting it because we deserve it. You deserve we it. Asked for it. We created yes, it. You asked for it. And we're going to, we'll, we'll be speaking about that again. I think we, yeah. I think it's already time to, uh, is the time again yeah. to, uh, quote yeah. Deuteronomy 27, 28, 29. And speaking of that, uh, we had uh, last last month. Uh, we have a small congregation of people here following Yeshua and uh, keeping the commandments of God. We had uh, unprecedented demon attacks on us, uh, obviously because some people got kind of weaker in their faith. They were not having enough faith, and they were just uh, trying to satisfy their, some of their own desires rather than you know waiting patiently for God to respond. We felt it. We, we, we had a kind of, that kind of crisis. But what we did, then I remembered the Bible speaks about curses and blessings. So what I did, I called for a Sabbath services in which we will be reading and reminding ourselves of curses and blessings. And I remember when Israel went into the, when entered into the promised land, one part of Israel, uh, part, uh, one half of tribes stood on one on one right. mountain, the other half stood on the other mountain, and uh, then, you know, one half would read about curses, the other would read about it, and the whole people said, Amen. So I said to the right. whole congregation, now, on this coming Sabbath, we are going to be standing up, and I'll be reading, you know, we'll be reading together curses and blessings, and I want you to be aloud and say, Amen. In that way, we want to invoke the blessings of God, and at the same time, send the curses to the authors of the curses, because we have got plenty of mediums and and, and witches and and people in 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 consultation with demons. Because friends, we live in a pagan nation anyway, Gentile nation, and it's uh, it's a common common thing in Gentile nations. Now, most of the Israelites were kind of spared from that kind of experience because you're God's people and God has protected you, but uh, not us in this Gentile nation, in this Gentile world. So we did it, you know, and ever since after that, we have. We have felt some kind of relief and some kind of progress that we have been making, making. And I'm thinking, you know, sometimes we should perhaps repeat this, <laughs> you know, yes, read again, yes. you know, stand up and read again, blessing yes. and cursing and say amen. And, you know, and perhaps that's what in the, in perhaps in our next, some of our next interviews, we can perhaps yeah. do that, read curses and blessings and yes. show, like you said, to the house of Israel that it deserves that great tribulation yeah. because of the curses that the house of Israel yeah. has brought upon itself. Now, yeah. in closing, yeah, in closing, if you would I, allow me, just a few more words. Sure, sure. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Few more words. Uh, we will get back now to Daniel 9. So it points out that although a deal is made in the middle, it will be over and the sacrifices will be stopped. And obviously, of course, sacrifices must start before they're stopped. So prophecy watchers, all of you who watch prophecy, you should see the resumption of regular animal sacrifice in Israel, in the state of Israel, as a sign the start of the Great Tribulation is not too far off, you see. Because one of these days, yes, the Jewish people are going to restore the uh, Old Testament sacrificial system. And uh, as it turns out, the former prince, who is later called a king in Daniel 11, is the one who will stop the sacrifices. Daniel 11 verse 31 
and forces shall be mastered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress, and they shall take away the daily sacrifice and place there the abomination of desolation. So yes, my dear friends, there will come a militaristic European king who will enter the state of Israel. I know the Jewish people will not love to hear this. I know that they probably think that their state is indestructible, but sadly, the house of Judah, my dear brothers, you're going to be punished again as well because of some various sins that you do against the Lord, against your your God. You may not, you don't have to believe in Mashiach, that it's Jesus Christ, fine. But what you do against God with your man-made religions and traditions is equally terrible. And the fact that you have the largest gay parade in the world in Tel Aviv is equally yeah. terrible. And the fact that you're so secular, so un- disinterested in God, just like many in the, house of Ju- in the house of Israel, is equally terrible. So there will come a militaristic European king, most likely. I'm convinced, but let's say most likely Kartel Lutzu Gutenberg, he'll enter the state of Israel. So, you know, it's most likely him, and we're here to watch. So, uh, he'll be either as the one, you know, or he might be the one who will support the one who will fill that role of that coming great monarch. And uh, the Mashiach tells us in Mark 13, 37, and what I say to you, I say to you all, watch. So, I hope that this interview my goal was indeed to um, bring to you the the most fresh understanding of the current events, to draw to your attention that there are uh, constantly uh, uh, there are constantly uh, conflict. No, no, no conflicts yet. Yeah, there are conflicts in the Middle East, but there is a constant uh, tension between Iran and the State of Israel. That Isaiah 22 obviously gives us. Uh, a prediction that very soon there will be an open regional nuclear war. European Union then, the United States of Europe will have to send their peace broker. By doing that, they're going to push out America, obviously, out of the out of the picture. And the peace broker, whoever that will be, will be the European, the, the, the first beast of Revelation 13, or the uh, European super dictator. According to what we read in the Bible, we can say, I can safely say that the most likely the one who will be will be Karl Theodor II Gutenberg, or if not him, it will be somebody supported by him. And uh, that means we're getting closer to the end, and we keep, we need, and I'll continue to warn the house of Israel, and I'll continue to send you out calling to repent and turn to your God, your God of Israel. Right. And that's that's what I was going to say. In In that, I was going to say, remember... You remember Yonah and Nineveh, uh, oh, okay. and, and the fact and the fact that if we repent, if we were able to repent as we should, we yes. could actually bring upon ourselves, uh, we could be saved. We could bring upon ourselves salvation. However, yes, because God will change His mind. You know. That's right. That's right. However, um, when Nineveh did it, they did it from the king on down. Yes, and uh, we have to do the same thing. It has to be from the kings on down. And I don't see that. I see way too many people who are, who are rebellious against the Father. Right. So let's, but hopefully, we'll doing, yeah, let's hope ahead. among our listeners there will be some individuals that will take all this to heart. And yes. that their stony heart, because the commandments written on the stone, <laughs> the symbol That's of the right. stony heart of Israel, that their heart, instead of being stone, will get mellowed and that they will understand how much they have sinned against God of Israel. God of Israel, who loves you so much, my dear house of Israel, that yeah. he blessed you beyond any imagination of any other nation. God right. of Israel, who still, nevertheless, has remained faithful to you, who has done something incredible. According to the Old Testament, when uh, one uh, when uh, um, uh, husband or wife dies the other party is free to remarry. Right. Now, somebody died for our sins, but somebody also died, my dear house of Israel, so that you'll be free to remarry. That you'll be free for the wedding ceremony, the the the, 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 the uh, marriage of the Lamb, that you'll have freedom to be again God's people. He has not turned his back on you. You have turned your back on him, but he is still faithful. Right. He's an amazing God. When you realize that, all of you French and Dutch, Belgians, British, and others, I hope at least the remnant of you will be weeping, as it says in Jeremiah, you'll be weeping, asking for the way to your home, right. to your land. That's exactly right, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, brother. It's been, it's been too long.
we'll have to do this again soon. Sure. Because there, there's still more, there's still more ground to cover, which is amazing because right. you, you spent two hours saying it as fast as you could. <laughs> and there's still, there's still more. Still, there's still more. more. Yes. And, uh, I appreciate that. And I apologize for, for getting in your way. Uh, I get inspired oh, no. when I listen to you. It's, it's hard. To, it's hard to keep my mouth shut sometimes. So oh, no, I'm happy. I'm happy with your interceptions because that, you know, always gives me inspiration to <laughs> to bring out something else that I remember that, okay. that is there in the scriptures. So. Well, and maybe maybe it'll give you a chance to take a breath, too. <laughs> well, that's yeah. another reason I can drink some water in the meantime. And so <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. And uh, we will very much look forward to the next time. And meanwhile, I have four words I always use with everybody on every one of these, and today is no exception. Those four words are words of advice to all of you who are listening, and they are, remember who Who you are. are. Amen. Amen. Let your people come together. Fresh and cool Running down the